Hello everyone, my name is Laurent Maurice Lafontaine. Welcome to the 14th edition of Massimadi, an Afro LGBTQ plus film and art festival. Massimadi support Massimadi support and distribute black queer artists and arts that showcase black queer, black queer realities all around the world. And this year, the festival has started on February 11 and will conclude on March 11. We have about 30 films and around 12 countries we present. And tonight, we want we will welcome Stephen Winter, the director of Chocolate Babies, and Nazir Feribi, the producer of All Boys Are in Blue. And this, this discussion will be moderated by Paris from Queer Films Concordia. And before everything be begin, I will now, we, we will see a clip of each film. Now, I know you just had the baby, and Gregory said the baby's name's going to be George. I was five years old when my teeth got kicked out. It was my first trauma. I always thought it was funny that my grandmother had three last names. To me and the other grandkids, she was simply Nanny. I was depressed at the start of second semester. I was, I was having fun, but deep down inside, I hated myself. Two others grabbed me by the arms and held me on the ground. I screamed for help as it was all I could do. I had a home because Nanny ensured it. When Nanny wanted something done, it got done. I gave her the biggest smile I ever had since the day I lost it. Our chapter was established by a founder of the frat in 1907, making us one of the oldest chapters in Black Greek history. No amount of money, love, or support can protect you from a society intent on killing you for your blackness. It was time for me to define me. I don't want to hear that. We are going to church this Sunday. Boy, don't you be talking to me like that. And don't be rolling your eyes at me like that. Boy, what is wrong with you? This is Sunday, and every Sunday I have to go through this. I don't want to hear it no more. You hear me? We are going to church, and I don't want to know anything about it. Larry, hmm, we are going to church. Now, if you want to come along, you can go upstairs and get yourself a tie and come on. Otherwise, keep your cocksucking ass here. You call yourself a church lady and talking about cocksuckers. But that is what they do, isn't it? You old woman. Who are you calling old, honey? You. Who am I honey, standing there in front of? I do not want to big old sinner, that's what y'all. You better what just take your ass you back downtown if you want to. You ain't nothing but a sinner. You what you can't mean? even play because like I'm as high a loop. Sissy, you, you can call you me whatever you want to. Okay, I think we're all back. Can you all hear me well? Is it working? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you both for joining us today. It's uh, definitely an honor to be speaking with you about these incredible films and their very, very interesting and curious format, which is a little bit easier to kind of start talking so that we can kind of ease our way into the more difficult and compli complicated themes that we speak about. So maybe let's talk with um, Stephen a little bit about the format of um, Chocolate Babies and the interesting way in which the film can come across as a documentary, but whilst it's a still a fiction film. So that's an interesting aspect of um, formatting and just deciding how to do that. So 
what kind of made you want to go about it that way or was that intentional or was that just something that came up with all of the beautiful colorful characters that we do see and all of the beautiful reactions that are in the film great that's a great way to start uh, i think what you're responding to is the beautiful intensity of the performers and when I made Chocolate Babies, we shot it in 1995 in New York City. So there were a lot of very talented black actors in the city, of course, but they were mainly in theater and um, other venues like that because film and TV had such a small limit of jobs. And um, so they had, we had these incredible community of really experienced performers who were also very much connected to the community. Um, and I cast those people. <laughs> so when they came together and embodied their characters, they felt like they were playing themselves, although that was indeed not what they were doing. And that's the style I like to run with. So um, it was never intended to be documentary-esque. It was meant to feel like you are in the drama itself, like as a fly on the wall. And I'm so glad they came across despite how over the top and, style and stylized it is. So, um, and that was indeed a way to like bring the, the realness of these are being HIV positive AIDS activists who are doing fabulous attacks on local politicians to make that make sense. Um, so you would just buy the premise and then roll with it. You know, when, uh, back then I remember I would tell people the premise, well, it's about HIV positive drag, black drag queens who are attacking local politicians. And people would say, oh, is that happening? because it didn't feel like at that time, at least that it was that big um, a leap, you know, ACT UP did do very wild things sometimes, like put a big condom over Jesse Helms' home or something like that. So it was taking those real life things that were happening and making them fantastical and specifically black. It's also interesting that you mentioned that because the, for me, the experience of watching the film many, many times, it's that it feels like you're watching characters that you know, especially if you have had one-on-one -on -one interaction with the, the drag queer community. It, it is representative of characters that is still in this day and age, like exist exactly like that. And people like that are still real and that's how they communicate as well. So to me, it's always felt a, a very close representation of reality. So that's why I kind of bring that up. So that was uh, that was very interesting as well. Um, I know in the story that you have uh, also done kind of a take on a format with uh, all boys aren't blue, because essentially what you're doing with that is, is kind of which are from the memoir that is actually, you know, life experiences, but performed by performers. So what was the kind of decision with that and how did that come to be? Yeah, so, you know, we, uh, it was a really fast turnaround with the project. Um, and so, you know, we obviously, you know, there's a few different adaptations of All Boys Aren't Blue. Um, right now, uh, George Matthew Johnson is working to turn it into a, a, te a television series with Gabrielle Union. Um, and so for us on, on our side, we wanted to do uh, a more, of a, more of a spoken word piece and more of a, um, more of a dramatic reading. Um, and so we shot it, you know, we, we put it together over the Christmas break going into 2021. Um, so December of like 2020, and um, we shot, I think it was January 9th, 2021. We, we, we put it together really fast and um, we shot it all in one day. And so um, we wanted to just, we wanted to really do the story justice. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, we didn't, you know, we didn't take on a whole narrative, you know, we didn't do it in a narrative um, conceptual way. Um, and so, but the way that, the way in which we did, uh, uh, the way in which we did take care of, which we did tell the story, excuse me, um, we, we definitely felt like we got the message across and really was able to make it compelling and, and, and enticing and all of that good stuff. So we're really proud of it. Yes, it does come across as lyrical, like uh, obviously. So the prose definitely do come through. So from that 
uh, aspect, I feel like it kind of kept the tone with the format as well. Now, speaking of these new formats and how kind of cinema has been evolving, we wanted to kind of start talking about seeing within uh, queer cinema as well as just Afro queer cinema because a little bit of a difference in the way that the evolution happens. So I wanted to ask you the question of how you think that because of the you both have done with uh, cinema and with form, do you think now that we have access to all the formats and medias and the new ways that we are our art, we are seeing evolution and the way that the art is being shared do you become more positive or do you think that it happened another door that has its own set of as well as the traditional way of uh, let's say publishing or distributing films you can uh, <laughs> kind of try and unpack that <laughs> yeah I, I mean i i personally think the, the more content the better you know what I mean? I think there, there are so many mediums out here and there's so many different avenues for people to get their story told. I think now there's really no excuse, right? Like if you have an iPhone and you have, you know, a story in your heart, you can execute it and put it up anywhere, whether it be, you know, YouTube or or Facebook or, or wherever the case may be, you know? So I, I love all of the new platforms. I think it's amazing. I think it gives creatives an outlet to really tell their story their way and their time. Um, and, and the gatekeepers are slowly but surely being uh, done away with. And so I think it's awesome. Agreed. Um, I also think- um, that... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just to say that, um... <laughs> The, 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 the thing that filmmakers have to do first is they have to learn their craft and technique. And um, if you do small format, small projects, so a considerable amount of them, whether they go this place or that place or this place or that place, each time you do a film, you learn more about your art form, you know, learn more about yourself within it. And um, it can help lead you up to something bigger, quicker. Um, that's really interesting that now that we're talking about a lot of uh, gatekeeping and uh, uh, with that, I just wanted to mention to Nisir because when the book was being published that it got back so many different uh, places in America and that was really crazy as well. So now that you kind of bring up these different mediums, it's also interesting because from one side, we have the conservatives trying to kind of ban this book and ban it from anybody ever hearing about it and children from reading it because, you know, they shouldn't have access to this information. And on the other side, it just blows up on TikTok and everybody's talking about it because they're like, no, if you ban something, we are going to be talking about it more. So that's, I feel like the, how, how was that? Like, what is the uh, kind of going through something like that? Yeah. Well, watching it, uh, watching it happen uh, to George and for George, um, was ver was very bittersweet. You know, at at the end of the day, you know, they got the last lot. Get they got the last laugh, um, being that you know, of course, you know, George's book was banned, or there was a lot of controversy surrounding it. But it's now a New York Times bestselling book. You know, George is now a New York Times bestselling author. So um, to watch it happen for them has been beautiful and, and amazing and serendipitous. And um, I'm beyond proud and, and happy for, for George that, you know, that, um, that they were able to get, you know, the last laugh in his way. It's, it's been quite sweet to watch. I mean, uh, it's been a while since, you know, 1996, uh, but I want to talk about uh, how do you feel, Stephen? Do you feel that the cinema as a whole has changed with gatekeeping? Is it uh, become better? Like, do you want to talk about that? Uh, I feel like uh, there is some sort of changes that we, what type of change they are, we can discuss. Well, sure. Um, well, back in the 90s, um, 
all independent films were funneled through a handful of independent film distributors that were all white. And they were um, put out in the world through a, a system of first tier and second tier and third tier film festivals that were also overwhelmingly run by white people. So when you were black and or queer, um, those are huge obstacles because there was no other way to get your film out there, much less go from place to place on your own, which I did do. Um, and so of course, 20 some years later, 25 some years later, everything is completely different. You know, there's streaming services um, and there is um, easier ways for one to make themselves known. So of course that is a tremendous change, you know, as it would be after two decades and for the better. But there's also, uh a shift in uh, the sub as well because in the 90s and 80s because of the HIV um, epidemic we were talking about that a lot and the threat of it and kind of the dread that everybody within the community was feeling so now that that conversation has kind of shifted what kind of um, changes can we see for Afro-queer filmmakers themselves like characters that do exist? Well, I think one great thing is that uh, cinema is no longer centralized as the highest, most popular art form because of the way that technology has shifted the way people view things and the way people consume ideas and personalities, poetry, um, modeling, um, uh, 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 being a personality of sorts. Those are ways to put yourself out there that you don't necessarily need the film to do. Um, and I think when I, I mean, I, I, I could rack my brain for particular examples, but when I think about like Brontes, per, uh, Brontes who uh, starts as a poet and performance artist, and now his work is being adapted into a film, um, it's almost like he doesn't need the film anymore. Like the film is great, but he'll always have been Brontes for the last 10 years because of the way he was able to assert himself in society, which is different. Um, does that uh, make sense for what the question was? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But um, there is also popularized uh, kind of things within mass media as well. So for instance, we had things like Pose, or um, we had Moonlight, which was critically acclaimed as well, which kind of bring the Afro-queer community to the forefront. But that is still leaves the question, are we certain where the money is going? Because there is this critical acclaim. So are we seeing more people of color or more queer people being hired to do these projects? Because historically what we've been proven is that the more popularized or mass media versions of commercially successful films that happen to be queer or happen to be about black people are made by white men who are usually just cishet. So that's also something that we can kind of think about that as well. Is it the, is the money itself going to the people that are within the stories that are about them? Or is it still the people who are trying to capitalize on this diversity of coda? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think um, in speaking to that, I think, you know, I think first and foremost, I do want to recognize that we that we have come a long way, right? Like it's it's been, we've made significant progress. However, we still have a long way to go. And for me, you know, what you're speaking to, it all goes back, in my opinion, to ownership. You know, like like ownership and capital. You know, who who owns the studios? Who can green light the films? Who owns the production companies? Who has enough capital um, to to put down? You know, five million dollars to make. Um, a moonlight or $10 million to make a, you know, whatever the project is, or, or, you know, like who can really finance these projects and are black people in a position to finance them? You know, we, we still have a long way to go to get to that point. Are um, black queer people in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position to finance them? You know, we still have a, we still have a long way to get to that point. So the higher up we go and the more we have that economic power, that economic dollar, the more we can have a say so about 
um, what kind of director and what kind of gaffer and what kind of cinematographer and who's going to be the lead and who's going to write the script, you know? Um, so yeah, like I said, we've made progress, but there's still long, there's still a long way to go to get to the point of ownership and capital where we can really, where we can fully control our narrative and make sure that it's being written, created, produced, directed, and distributed in the way in which we see fit. I agree. Um, I also, I, I, it's also important to contextualize, you know, that um, the change, what changes that we've seen in the industry when it comes to allowing Black people, queer or not, to control their narratives is within the last two, five, seven years. <clears throat> it's not a 20 year journey that we've been on. We've been on decades and decades, generation after generation of black artists in film having either a glass ceiling or a literal you know brick ceiling keeping them from doing what they wanted to do to a place where a, a no studio or production company worth their salt would begin a black queer narrative without having a black queer lead as one of the primary artists um so that's good it's also very recent you know so um i think it's important for us to uh as a community stay the course to hold the industry and not just the industry, but the people within the world that we intersect with who represent the industry to hold everyone to account and hold everyone to the promise, the beautiful promise that can be made when trans people get to tell trans stories, when black people get to tell black stories, when black queer folk get to tell black queer folk stories without question. So, um, and that, that's done one-on-one. -on -one. You know, that's people speaking up in the moment, you know, to say this or that, to help bolster that across the society that makes films. Because that's who makes films, it's people. It's the companies do it, but it's the people within who are answering the phones and typing out the memos and organizing the schedules and making those decisions. Everybody helps towards, it's a communal exercise. Mm -hmm. So we have to continue to hold our community across the board um, to bear for these principles. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of uh, these types of um, communities as well, whenever there is people in power who are not belonging to a certain community and they want to start kind of projects that are more inclusive, that are more diverse, we start to see a little bit of a stereotyping and a little bit of attributes that they kind of decide belong to a specific types of people, a specific types of uh, queer people or uh, different minority groups. So how can we kind of navigate the world around that? And do we still think that even now we are beholden to certain characteristics that, that the companies want us to have as artists? Do we think that it's gotten to the point to have more authentic representation that we fit in with the flamboyant gay character? however a stereotypical else uh, put it. I mean, I, I think that we, I, I mean, I think it, a lot of it, it starts on the page. You know what I mean? It starts on the page and then, you know, after, if you're going through the studio system, then obviously, you know, the, the producers get involved and the directors get involved and, and then studio execs get involved. And so things can kind of snowball from there as you're, as you're sort of accumulating notes. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I think maybe, you know, we have to make sure that we are not complicit and make sure that we are doing our just do and, and being authentic with our, with our own stories. Um, it was the best example that I can think of. It was, it was, um, I was having a, a, a conversation with my best friend who is a, um, a, a black, uh, straight cisgendered woman. Um, and it was maybe about three years ago. And, and I said, um, I was watching a show and I, and I was saying, I'm so sick of black gay men being treated as accessories. And she said, well, if you're sick of black gay men being treated as accessories, what are you going to do about it as a black gay man? And I was like, oh, thank you. 
Um, so, you know, it, it was it was a nice wake up call and a nice smack in the face for me to really hold myself accountable and 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 recognize, you know, what I could do. And that's not to say that there isn't a whole system and a whole structure that feeds those stereotypical um, attributes. Of course, there are. But for me, you know, that's such a macro thing to tackle. And for me, I just prefer to focus on the micro goal, which is just like, okay, well, how can I, as a writer, as a producer, as a director, how can I select specific projects or how can I create specific projects and partner with people to make sure that we are all in alignment with telling a full multidimensional story? I think I know what you were talking about. That was a few years ago, because I remember talking with my best friend a few years ago about the all of a sudden, in every TV and movie that had a white gay character, their boyfriend or girlfriend was black. <laughs> like all of a sudden it happened overnight. Every gay character, uh, male or female, who was white, who was a, had a real part in that show or movie, their boyfriend would show up, they'd be black, they'd have no character. And there was like an easy way that you could slide in some representation um, oh, yeah. make the white gay character a little more interesting because they're in an interracial relationship. And my friends and I who are also who are black gay men were like, we have never seen that many interracial relationships in a general population when we go to a gay bar or some such place. And it is so clearly a play for easy representation because those black lovers never become a real character. <laughs> um, and that was a few years ago. And now we've kind of slowly started moving past that um, because now it's a joke people can make fun of. Um, and, uh, you know, as a TV trope or as a movie trope, and they could be a little bit better on that. Like, uh, there's a, there's a big gay movie out right now called Three Months starring Troy A. Sivan, Troy Sivan. And it's pretty good. It's on Paramount Plus. It's a gay movie and it's about HIV waiting to get the results of an AIDS test. And the boyfriend is, um, of Arab descent. And it's wonderfully drawn character with a with a that person has a true backstory. They have a uh, their community is also part of the narrative. They're not just showing up in the white guy's world. They they have their own thing going on, and that to me is like, well, that's a step forward from 2015. <laughs> um, so uh, all that to say, <laughs> what was the original question? <laughs> No, no, we're good. We're just, uh, it's you know, kind of like I, going I, back to the I, same. I can, I can answer the question. You don't have to, so the, what we can do today, like I remember years ago, um, one of the black elders told me that he said, we will know we have overcome when there are lousy black directors making lousy black themed films that we don't have to support <laughs> because they're just able to be out there like, average white guys making their movies and doing their thing. We could have it's there, we know it's there, it's fine. We don't have to support it if we don't want to. We as queers do not have to support what we think are silly or outdated queer or gay storylines. We can focus on the things that are good because <clears throat> there's a lot more out there even now than there was in 2019. Yeah, I, I, I love the, the, I just saw the caption, let us be lousy. Um, let I, us I, be lousy. My, my, my take on that is that, you know, we as, you know, people of color or, or as, as people that are sort of at the intersection, at the intersection of being, you know, marginalized, whether it be, you know, black and gay or Latino and gay or whatever, however it is you identify, um, you know, we don't get the grace to fail up. You know what I mean? Like we do not get the grace to fill up. If we make one bad movie, it's like you are donezo. And it's like, it's like, whoa, wait, can I like, like, you know, you don't get a chance to really find your legs. You don't get a chance to really find your voice as a writer, producer, director. It's like, no, you are a goner. You obviously can't do it. Like you got the go, you got the bounce, peace out. But you know, I, I would love, and that's one of one of the things on my mission is to is to give people the grace to fail up and help them figure them help them figure who who they are who figure out who they are as an artist. You know what I mean? And so to to second what you just said, it's like that's when we know that we have arrived. That that it's sort of like that it's a that it's an even even playing field, so to speak. It's like hey hey look, you made you made three bad movies. Give them another one. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a measure of something. It's Absolutely. definitely a measure of something. And as an audience member, it's also a measure of something. You used to be able to count all the queer films on one hand 
at any given time. And now in terms of queer media, there's a lot that you can dive into. Mm -hmm. And right. leaving other things out if you don't like the way that they're, you know, if you think it's not right. Mm -hmm. Because it feels like for the longest time, Hollywood has been trying to, on the, of course, Hollywood side, the commercial cinema, trying to kind of combat this idea or the audience or, you know, queer artists have been combating this idea that black, black queer films don't sell or queer films don't sell. Time and time again, we see these big budget with uh, queer characters, with black characters as the lead and they do well but then they disappear so we see like one-offs that are critically acclaimed like moonlight we see like one-offs like girls trip we see these things that pop up and prove all of the box offices and all of the ideas surrounding audiences and what the audience demands wrong but it feels like we're still kind of combating that mm -hmm. well but also, film has fallen apart. You know, Girls Trip did not beget a lot of black driven films, but it did beget a lot of black women on television doing their thing. Yeah. Run the World, Harlem, Grand Crew. Grand Crew. Um, things. Like, I, you know, like it's, it's not, I'm I, sorry. I, it's not like, you're going. Yeah. I don't know if in was insecure pre girl trip or around the same time. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can't remember, but I'm insecure. But you know, sorry, sorry, I, I cut you off. Sorry. No, it's just I think um, one of the ways to think about this, sitting from February 2022, is that it is important to respect the fact that cinema has moved forward both as an art form and as a commercial venture. It is no longer central. It's important and it's cool and it's beautiful, but it's not central like it was even five years, even in the moonlight year. You know, so um, people putting themselves out there as loud and proud black folks, whether queer or not, and you, you brought up girl strips and that's like, you know, black women doing their thing. Um, Black women doing their thing, you can see much more of it now than you can pre-pandemic. <laughs> and that's exciting, you know? And eventually a couple of, like Issa Rae's a movie star. She can do movies when she as she's moving forward. These things are specific, but the but the wake that it leaves in its, in its, in its path can be considerable if you open up bigger than film. <clears throat> You know, and um, and I think that's also important to recognize. Girls Trip did not beget a lot of movies, but it did beget a lot of media. And I think it is, um, I think we could also say that Black queer stories is going to find similar stuff in its wake. Like what you're developing with uh, with Ms. Union. You know, this the, that's the kind of thing that will, it will find root eventually because there's now a demand for it. There is now a lane that's open that says black stuff, black women, black queers, all important. I don't mean like diverse, like you know what, how big anything should be because it's um it's pretty open. There could be a black queer blockbuster. Mm -hmm. yeah. There could be. It's uh, the particulars that have to go together to make that happen. But Lil Oz Next is around. She, he could make a movie. You know, there are things that could happen, you know, um, but it's not so much about we have to change the movie industry. The movie industry is going to just do its thing. We've got to be artists who know ourselves, who are making these authentic stories work in whatever way they end up working. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I think I think we're about to see, uh, you know, another thing with um, Brian Tyree Henry, who's going to sure. play the first, you know, uh, I think black gay superhero. So, you know, you know, so again, you know, progress has been made, but still, still a long way to go, but every great thing takes time. I do want to just quickly clarify something. Um, I'm not working on the series. All boys aren't blue. Um, oh. that's, that's just George, just the FYI, but, um, but I would like to be, we'll see what happens. You know. 
Well, yeah, it, it, it all, it all, it all, it all, it all, it all intersects when you're moving yeah. towards the same goals. You know, having a black gay superhero in a studio film was institutionally inconceivable in 2017. Why? Because mm -hmm. Black Panther hadn't come out yet. So up until that point, Black Panther was still pretty much industry inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And now it's standard. So as much as we have to continue to fight for what it is that we need, it is important to acknowledge these things that did happen because of what we've done. They didn't happen in a vacuum. They happened because people like us were fighting for it. And then other people who didn't know they needed it now love it. Everybody loves RuPaul. Right? The, yes, and there is a, kind of like a difference, I feel, between how we are progressing with cinema and with television. Sometimes it feels like television is moving at a much faster rate and things that we do see like tropes or different genres and different characters and representation that we do see in television takes a while to translate over to film. Yeah. And um, it, it is interesting to think about why that is and the people that are hiring or the producers and the the money men essentially and how different they are in television and in film because we are now seeing for the first time a lot of more um, black producers and black directors and black writers and this is kind of like something that's happening I feel like for the first time to this scale of course it's still a crazy number when you think about it because there is just a huge underrepresentation but it's way more than we have ever seen before but it yes. it i don't feel the same way with um with uh, hollywood in cinema speaking of that so that's um yeah and how, that's remember movies, it's a totally different business model uh, uh the best way to look at it is that tv is fast food and and movies are a bespoke gourmet meal <laughs> It takes um, a lot of more energy and resources to make one fabulous thing than to figure out a way to make 12 of them or 20 of them, you know, at a go. Um, so the math is different, the stakes are different, people are doing it for different reasons, and it's, you know, the runway is long on either way. But um, one of the reasons that cinema lags behind television is that it takes so long for not just the artist to get their idea together, but for the ducks to go in the row for something like that to happen. I would, I would say not to concern oneself that much with what the industry is doing and to focus on what you, what you as an, as an artist or as a, as a, as an audience member want to see and continue to gravitate yourself towards those situations. Um, again, cinema has completely been upended. It is not the same thing in 2022 as it was in 2012, even when I think the, what was the 2012 best picture? 12 Years a Slave? Maybe that was 12 Years a Slave? Um, yeah, I think it was around that time, either that or right before it. Back then, the primary place to go get an important story that reflects on human, hu human issues, is, and we're thunders around Black people, was film. 12 Years a Slave, important film. You gotta see it in the theater, right? Now, that art, uh, uh, now it's, uh, it would be a prestige Amazon series. They wouldn't do 12 Years a Slave as a movie anymore because the business model of what the artwork needs to be has changed. Mm -hmm. So um, as much as it's important to keep one's eyes on the prize and honor cinema for what it is and honor film um, and honor the experience of going to the theater, which I don't think is gonna die, but it will change um, it's important to remember the needs that we have an audience can be fulfilled in other ways. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, totally. I think another factor with, with TV versus film is that in TV, you know, you can, you know, if you're doing eight episode series, if episode five sucks, you can recover in episode six. You know what I mean? Versus in film, like you said, in film, you've been writing and, and, and putting, you know, storyboarding, et cetera, for, you know, years and it's shot, it's in the can, and then you test it with audiences, then it goes out, then it is kind of is what it is. With TV, again, the word grace again, you can kind of get, you get a little grace to kind of figure things out a little bit more, but still, you know, not a ton, but you get a little more grace, a little more time to kind of like work out the kinks with different things. And so 
Yeah, and 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 in regards to like, you know, not being concerned about what the industry uh, is doing, um, I, I I watched this interview with Shonda Rhimes. I mean, it was like ten or fifteen years ago or something like that. And she was talking about how um, when she came up with the concept of Grey's Anatomy, she she was aware she was aware that the head of ABC wanted a medical drama. And, and I'm paraphrasing by the way, but, and she said, okay, well, how can I give them a medical drama in my way? And so she turned in a character driven, you know, um, enticing medical drama. And so you have to kind of find, in, in my opinion, you have to kind of find, you know, your, your way and your why within the confines of the industry and kind of figure out how to how to execute your mission within the bubble of this huge ass, um, you know, system, you know what I mean? And so Shonda was obviously able to do it with Grey's Anatomy 19 seasons later. Um, so, you know, that would be my piece of advice for people that's like, okay, yeah, like, okay, so, th so the head of Netflix wants this. Okay, cool, got it. How can I give them that, what they want in my way and see how it works? And obviously as the ball gets rolling, you know, you don't know how things are going to pan out. You know, you really, really don't know. This this place, this Hollywood business, you know, this whole industry, it's such a faith walk and it's such a crapshoot. It's such, you know, it's such a, and, and, and I think beyond that, it's also like, it's a, it's a test of consistency. Like how long can you really stay around? How long can you really stick in it? I mean, you know, you, you know, you shot your, your movie in what 90, like you said, 95, 96. And here it is cut to, you know, 2022 and, you know, the seeds that were planted are now blossoming. And so it's such a, it's such a triathlon. And so a lot of it is just being consistent and, and staying in it. And knowing who you are, knowing what it is that you want to say. Yeah. And, and what you won't do. Yes. That's super important to know what you won't do. Oh, please know what you won't do. <laughs> Trouble, baby. Ooh. Say that again. Mm -hmm. That's right. What kind of changes can we make, like as for instance, to help the community, or what kind of changes would you like to see the movie goers and cinephiles making uh, moving forward? I mean, support. You gotta go buy buy the movie. Go 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 to the movie theater if if you feel safe. Um, you know what I mean? It's like uh, go promote it on social media. Tell people about it. You know, I remember like when um, I can't think of a good I can't think of a good example right now. But I like you know when um, I'm trying to think of a good movie like Do the Right Thing came out, and it was just sort of like it was just like a passing of the baton of like. Hey, did you go see do the right thing? Hey, did you go see do? You know, it's like having that dialogue and really passing the baton and 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 lifting as we climb and making sure other people support your work. You know, um, something that I saw from a few of my industry buddies here when um, Queen and Slim came out, they bought fifty tickets and they were like, "Hey, fifty tickets on me! Uh, leave my name at the at the arc light in Hollywood," and it was awesome. So a little bit went a long way, you know. Yeah, because sometimes, um, well, most of the times it feels that as, uh, you know, minorities, we have to be making the space for ourselves because it doesn't uh, necessarily exist within Hollywood and within all these different modes. So it feels like we are constantly trying to make those spaces. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I try not to get caught up on that, even, even in the the context of like us being, you know, I, I, when you, when you'd say minorities, I, I think of um, a, a speech that Prince gave when he said, look around, there's nothing minor about you. You know what I mean? And so I think a lot of it kind of also has to do with like, um, you know, the thinking and the belief system and some semantics and phrasing and things like that. It's like, I don't really get, I try not to get concerned about making space because I am the space, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, like, um, you know, their ice isn't colder to me. I, I like my ice just fine, you know what I mean? So. 
Um, okay, so I think we're going to open to questions. We have a couple from Facebook. I'm going to go ahead and ask one um, for you. Someone has asked, how does working with a literary source affect the filmmaking process yeah I, I feel like my director could probably speak better to that but I'll, I'll give it a shot since I'm here um <laughs> I mean it, it it I think it gave a solid blueprint right you know we, we weren't coming up with the story from scratch um which was good you know it, it was a really beautiful adaptation and um so we really had it there it was literally on the page and so I think it made it easier um, you know, I'm in, I'm in um, development on a, um, on a feature now and, you know, we're, we're, we're chugging away at the script and, you know, figuring it out and working out the kinks and, and establishing the story. And obviously, you know, George had um, done that already with All Boys Aren't Blue. So I would say, if anything, it gives a solid blueprint of what's already, uh, you know, you can just get picture up and, and, and go shoot the thing, you know? So it was, it was super awesome. It was super awesome to have that blueprint. Uh, also, Laurent had a question for you, Stephen. Uh, they were wondering, what do you wish to see in the way we tell stories about AIDS that is still exists today? Oh, that's a great question because um, so many people assume that it doesn't exist today, <laughs> um, and indeed it does. Um, so, what would I like to see? Uh, a continual uh, uh, people. Like I remember back in the 90s, AIDS was often used as a plot pivot, you know, to add some unearned gravitas for some reason. This person's HIV positive, they get the test back, HIV, et cetera, and so forth. And back then, you know, it was a dire situation if you uh, uh, were HIV positive. Um, but uh, now people generally only go to that subject matter if they've got something to do if they have something to say about it, some kind of sensitivity around the subject. So I would continue encouraging layered and um, uh, human stories that are have HIV within, within them. Mm -hmm. Also, there was um, another greatly, question from Glenn saying, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I admire great, oh, it went away. I admire greatly how Stephen was able to capture the activism of the, yeah. Found that while also reading Sarah Schulman's novel, Rat Bohemia. What questions, what stories about activism places in New York do you think of from that time? Like what are my favorites? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> what a, oh. What movies from that time, from the nineties do I like? I really like, if that's the question, um, I really like Go Fish by Rose Troche. I like, um, I, I like a movie called um, Poison by Todd Haynes. Um, you know, Harris's bro. Uh, yeah, you know, all the good ones. What's that one from 83 about the black lesbian who has the hack radio? Um, Directed by Lizzie Borden. That one, whatever that is, you can Google it. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Friday night, um, my brain's a little. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Also, another question uh, for you, Esther, was how was the communication between the filmmaking creatives and the writer on the project that you were doing? It was amazing. Yeah, it was really amazing. Um, you know, like, like I said, you know, it was really on the page and George was, um, I think George really gave Nathan free reign of how to adapt um, of, or of, of adapting the, the film um, and really piecing, you know, the beautiful story together that he that he that he did that Nathan did. And so it was it was pretty seamless. You know, we all had an amazing time really working together. It was great. Um, and looking forward to doing it, in, doing it again whenever the time presents itself. Um, also, the film was uh, Born in Flames, so we got Born that. And <laughs> and we had another question. Um, how did you develop a successful producer filmmaker relationship? Um, I think by well, again, consistency, but I think. 
This is a good question. Uh, well, with Nathan, it's easy. You know what I mean? Because he's a big brother and a mentor to me. So he's a little different. Um, it's pretty effortless, um, you know, and I definitely fall into my little brother role. And it's like, hey, what you need? What you, you know, what, what you want to do? Like, I got this, you know what I mean? So it's pretty effortless. That doesn't, you know, working with him doesn't really take a lot of effort. Um, I know him. He knows me. I know his, I know down to his verbiage. I know his lingo on set. I know he forgets his director's book, you know, like, you know, on set when he leaves for the night, like I, and I know, grab it, I'll, you know, so I know all those different things. I know, you know, when he's meditating and listening to Whitney Houston at the top of the day, like, so that stuff you just kind of like learn, I would say with other filmmakers, um, <laughs> you have to uh, work through your ego and work through yourself stuff and really be malleable really really be malleable um but i've been fortunate that i've had um two directors in particular nathan head williams and a gentleman by the name of kai streets that i work with really really often and it's just you know i don't know we're, we're all you know we're all either pisces or aquarians it's just there's just a shorthand it's just i mean really the epitome of magic um so you know yeah they're amazing I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't answer that better. I'm sorry. No, that was good. Like you, you said, <laughs> you, good. there's a yeah. vibe, you know, and that, that's how, that's how any kind of good partnership happens. Like it happens naturally and it's a vibe and it's productive and it makes you feel good to work together. If it ever yeah. makes, if it does not, if a relationship makes you feel bad, you shouldn't do it anymore. Like finish yeah. the gig, but then call it. Yeah, I, I now know why, you know, I now know why Scorsese constantly works with Leonardo DiCaprio. I now know why Ryan Coogler is like, oh, get me Michael B. Jordan. I'm like, I didn't get it before. And then working with Kai and Nathan, I was like, oh, no, everything them too. I like, if it's not them, I'm not doing it. You know what I mean? It's just when, when you've had it, so when you have it good like that, you don't want to go back to other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's another question for Stephen that says, um, was there a moment in your filmmaking process where you thought your vision was either bolstered or compromised solely by the condition of the production? Bolstered. Because when you have the only resources you have are your imagination, a meager budget, and really excited crew and cast members, nothing becomes an obstacle anymore. You just figure out what it is you need um, and make it work within the context of what's going on. You know, um, I want a car for this scene. I want three cars for the scene. You only get one. Well, you figure out a way quickly to make it just as exciting with the one car. That is um, always the way to do it. Because no matter how much money you have for whatever, you still don't have enough to do everything. So you just always use the 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 um the, the 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 things you don't have what's the word for that <laughs> it's that friday night brain happening you use your whatever lack that you have and turn it into a positive by uh using your imagination for the resources i could totally say that better but i think you know what i'm saying well i'm we're, we're picking up what you pit what you're putting that it's friday night yeah don't don't think of it as a negative you know like what you were uh, the reason that uh you use the same actors that you vibe with is because casting is like 80% of directing. Like once you've cast it correctly, then you're good because they're in charge of the character. You're in charge of making it great. And y'all work together to make every moment indelible in some way. Um, so if everybody on the crew and everybody in the cast and everybody who's involved in the situation is well, is there for the right reason, you don't really have that many problems you know directors who scream and yell are the ones who haven't planned it out enough or their egos are in the way or they're not so there's a question <laughs> for both of you as well <laughs> or they're nuts <laughs> um so how do you decide which project to launch after <laughs> such defining pieces that you've had in both of those colorful careers, both of you, you can uh, either or. 
Um, that I mean, that's a really awesome question. I mean, I'm still figuring it out day by day, you know, in, in full transparency, you know, um, I've been fortunate. I've had two really strong quality films back to back um, that I that I was the lead producer on. And I want to keep that momentum and keep my projects being strong. And so um, maybe, you know, to answer eloquently, I would say uh, not being afraid to say no. That's been a new thing for me. Um, I've been saying no a lot these past few months and I'm like, oh, this, you know, it's, it's foreign territory for me because I'm used to just like, you know, go, 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 run, 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 get it, get it, get it. And I'm like, actually, no, I don't want to do that. And no, I don't, I don't want to do this. And no, I don't want my name on this or no, I don't want to cast that person or no, I don't want to work with that person. You know, it's like not being afraid to say no and sticking by it. And sometimes, listen, sometimes you do miss the boat. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I said no to something a, a, a while ago and I was like, shit, Damn, looks like it's doing well. But it's like, you know, that those things happen and really trusting your gut and following your instincts. And so, and also like, I'm also practically speaking, I love a good old list of listing out the pros and cons of things and being like, okay, I could do this and I could do that. You know what I mean? It's just really laying it out. So lots of different ways. I have a diverse portfolio of different projects and different mediums of different genres. And I keep pushing them all forward at the same time and see what pops. Mm -hmm. And um, I make sure that I'm as inspired by all those projects. It's not like I have A projects and my B level projects. I love them all. I want to do them all. But um, I understand that different the different projects need different resources. So um, I keep them all up in the air. And I only let something bounce or drop when I'm just not into it anymore. You know, some of the projects that I've done had a gestation period of a year. Some had a decade. <laughs> um, but the reason they were still in my mix is because I still cared about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I break down my projects um, according to like I say some of my babies and some of my my godchildren, um, and that's the way that I reference them. And I go, oh, like, oh, that's my that's my god that's my goddaughter. You know, I'm trying to take proper care of her, but this is my baby and this is really my top priority. And so um, similar to Steven, you know, I'll have, I try to keep it at like six. So that way I'm not going too crazy. That's quite a few. Yeah. I try to keep it at like, like I only got six right now because it's difficult. It's not easy. Um, so. Um, there's a COVID related question there for Stephen. Did cultural production around COVID and epidemic affect how you think about your story from another epidemic? Oh, wow. Oh, because of chocolate babies. Oh, I see. That's um, a good question. Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, during the, 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 the second year of the pandemic, uh, my films were picked up for the Criterion channel and they played there. And I believe one of the reasons why they were so excited to get them at this juncture is because how, not only because of Black Lives Matter, but also because that it was an epidemic themed film that the relevancy was even more stark and dramatic uh, to speaking to towards today. And the other cool thing about Chocolate Babies is that because the characters are so flamboyant and they wear costumes as their regular clothes, it doesn't feel, the film has a timeless fashion to it. It doesn't feel like 1995. It feels like it could be any time in New York because the clothes don't scream 1995. Um, and neither do the subject matter because when you are oppressed, when you are desperate, at a certain point, anything goes, you know? So um, the activism that the characters are embodying are not, they're specific to HIV and blackness as it related to the mid nineties, but they're also a universal complaint of that my humanity matters as well. So um, I think that's great. <clears throat> Okay, I think that's all the time that we have for questions. Thank you both so much for joining us. It's been an incredible opportunity to brain and talk about your incredible 
films you're doing. So thank you for imparting your and your knowledge. We appreciate it greatly. Yes, thank you for having us. We appreciate it. That's a real treat, a real joy. It's great to see you. I'm glad that your yellow shirt and my blue shirt blended so well in the video. For, it's, the, it's the blue wall for me. Like that blue wall is just epic. <laughs> thank you thank you it's uh i changed it every few years it used to be orange it is gorgeous i love it thank you so much mm -hmm. as is as is the resolution on your camera for your lovely face uh, th thank you <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna take the work thank you i appreciate it <laughs> <laughs>